We're probably using the Philippines on three. One, two, three. We're a local uh, uh, label, uh, Soul Supplement Records, uh, one of our sponsors, oh, and wow. uh, they, Corduroy Mavericks was the, uh, the artist on there. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Wow. Well, we'll give it up for our new song. Yeah. There yeah. You know, yeah. That's cool. Well, I'm Jason Outlaw, and this is what's in the news, everybody. Uh, the Olympic pole vaulting competition was decided when Japan's number one pole vaulter missed a gold medal when his penis hit the bar on the way over. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's, it's crazy pole vaulting, and uh, it, it's poor work when the little pole actually makes you lose. It's the little pole. Uh, Don't. Yeah, yeah. I, actually, I believe they say that pole vaulting is a game of inches. Is that, is that true? I think it, it is. Makes sense. Makes I think sense. it is. <laughs> inches. I, I, where's my life going, Lenny? I don't, I don't even know. All right. Um, KFC's in the news. That's right. Thanks to KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken. There is a... Uh, Fried chicken sunscreen that is now out on the market. That's Fried right. Fried chicken sunscreen. Yes, yes, yes. I'm glad it's mainstream finally. I've been using it for years, said Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> it works, it works. He's the same color as fried chicken. He is. He's the same color. Same color. Um, Pokemon Go is suddenly getting a lot of bad reviews. That's right. Players are angry after an update makes it impossible to hunt for Pokemon. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, that's what I said. Um, the upset players said they will stop playing the game and go back to looking for Waldo. <laughs> Where's Waldo? Where is he? All right. Striped shirt. I was him one year for Halloween. Just throwing that out there. No one found me. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> um, the FBI says it can't find hackers to hire because they all smoke weed. Okay. Yes. Yes. And actually, they got some advice. Uh, they should actually hire crackheads, just like the IRS. <laughs> Take that, IRS. <laughs> yes, I still owe you money. <laughs> All right, good. All right. Um, a man who claims God punishes gays with floods had his home destroyed a flood of biblical proportions. That's right. The minister immediately, when he realized it was flooding, looked for shelter at his favorite gay club. <laughs> yeah, that's where he went. That's how I would dance. I don't, I don't know. At the gay club, I, I, that's it? Yeah, I don't yeah, go to right, clubs. Right. Like, oh, break it down. All right. Uh, the Olympics uh, is finally over. That's right. With, uh, with not one person contracting the Zika virus. Yes. Yes. Except for Ryan Lockie. Well, actually, he made up a story about catching it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. But actually, actually, in all seriousness, and, and this is absolutely true, um, and not many people know this, but Ryan Lockie did catch a virus that killed off all his sponsors. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, did I get a ooh off that? It's, it's amazing. It's ooh o'clock. It went quick. That's what it is. It was, ooh, I got a, we got some Ryan Lockie fans out there? No? Yeah? No. <laughs> They're like, no. Like, mm, liar. Mm. 
is a swimming liar. Is swims. Um, <laughs> Hillary Clinton says she stands behind Leslie Jones after Leslie Jones uh, had some vicious nude photos that turned out due to a hacker. That's right. Uh, Hillary Clinton said she won't stand too close to Leslie Jones because she might find a way to get more votes somewhere else. Oh, oh, is that the one? <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, give it up for DJ Lenny Alfonso! <laughs> We have the founder of Battleborn Slam right here in Las Vegas. Please welcome AJ Moyer. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. Oh, for sure. Thank you for coming this evening. How's it going? Pretty good. Yeah? Pretty good. How about yourself? Very well. Very Excellent. well. Pleased to have you. Oh, glad to be here. Yeah. I'm so happy to hear that. So. Before we start, mm -hmm. I just told everyone that you're the founder of Battleborn Slam. Yes. In Las Vegas. Can you yep. tell us what that is? Um, it's a poetry slam. We're currently the city's only certified poetry slam, but soon to be adding another one. That means that we send representatives to compete at the National Poetry Slam, at the Individual World Poetry Slam, all of the national events that are certified by Poetry Slam Incorporated. Very cool. Very cool. And so what is a poetry slam? Uh, it's a performance poetry competition invented in the 1980s. It's, uh, each poet gets three minutes and a little bit of a grace period to perform their own original work without the accompaniment of props, costumes, nudity, or any music that is not made with their own bodies. So it's really mm -hmm. just the performer and the microphone and the audience and their three minutes to do the best that they can to influence and affect people with that. Cool. What's an example of body music? Um, body music, we've seen people do uh, beatboxing. I've seen people beatbox and breakdance together on stage. I've seen people incorporate armpit farts into their poems. <laughs> that's what I wanted to know. Oh, that yeah, was here, yeah but... that's yeah, one of them. Yeah. How about burping, ever? Um, I haven't seen it used within a poem, but I wouldn't be surprised if it happened. It's out there somewhere. Yeah, cool. it's probably been done. <laughs> All right. All right, good to know, good to know. And how did you get involved with Poetry Slams at all? Um, I, I attended Northern Arizona University a while back and my freshman year, one night I was just out walking around with my roommate and we happened to cross a sign for the Flag Slam, which is their local Poetry Slam. We decided we'd go and check it out and really enjoyed it. Went back the next week and signed up and started going back every week that we could and participating and got really involved right away. Awesome. How does it feel when you're up there performing? Uh, it's pretty intense. If you're doing something new that you haven't really shared with people before, it's, it, you're really exposed. Because sure. as I said, with the format, it's just you and the microphone. There's nothing to cover you up if you slip up, if you have a hard time, if you get too wrapped up in your own emotions. So you're really exposed up there. But it can be a really re rewarding experience, too, because you know, if you really rock the audience and you feel super into your poem, you almost have an out-of-body experience where it's like you're watching yourself do the poem the best it can be done. And it's a, it's a really amazing feeling I bet. to be able to have. Sounds awesome. So how do you prepare in writing your works and performing them? Uh, for writing, I'm a huge believer in trying to get it all on page before you ever touch editing. If you start trying to tweak things as they're coming out, you're going to wind up sidetracking yourself. So it's all about really spilling everything that you can out on this, onto the page, just sort of opening yourself up and letting it flow and then worrying about the rest in editing. And then when you're preparing to go on stage, I like to practice in front of a mirror. It's really good for performance to be able to see everything that you're doing and not wind up in that like, oh, what am I doing with my hands <laughs> moment on stage and get too awkward. That way you're sort of paced and prepared and ready for the audience. Have you ever written a tongue twister for yourself by accident? Um, not 
certainly not intentionally, but there have been some that have come up in pieces where you realize in practice as you're starting to memorize and you say it faster and faster, like, oh, I, I can't <laughs> say that phrase the way it's written. So sometimes you have to edit around that or, sure. or do uh, some, some linguistic exercises. Totally. The red leather, yellow leather, all those <laughs> kinds of things. Some warm-ups. Yeah. Cool. Fair enough. So what is it about downtown Las Vegas that is so perfect for the work that you're doing? Um, it's fantastic because we have such an expressive community down here. Um, even the folks who aren't into the art or aren't a part of the arts, I should say, are very into the expression and into the arts. A lot of the tech community especially is, has been really, really supportive of everything that we've done throughout the years. And it's been fantastic to give an opportunity for people to come out and express themselves in a new way. Mm -hmm. I've found that recently through, through the slam and through other things I do in my life, I keep meeting all these fantastic managers and executives for different companies. and about half of them that I run into wind up actually recognizing me because they came to an open mic at oh, some point cool. or they participated in a slam at some point and I would have never guessed, but it's, it's a really fantastic connector for people. Amazing, that's awesome, cool. And how else would we be able to find you if people wanted to learn more about what Battleborn Slam is doing? Uh, the best way right now is on Facebook. Uh, we've got a profile page. Battleborn is the first name. Slam is the last name. Somehow we've managed to slip by their filters on that and still be able to keep a fan or a, <laughs> a profile page instead of a regular fan page. Nice. That's the best way to connect with us. Cool, cool. And I, I have to ask, mm -hmm. I heard you write some pretty cool haikus. Yeah. Do you think you could do one for us? Yeah, sure. A haiku is a Japanese form of poetry that is five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. Currently in the slam community, we have head-to-head -head haiku at the National Poetry Slam, which is a little bit looser on the uh, format. It's not always specific in the number of syllables for each line, so it's technically, I think, more of a senryu, if I'm remembering the name correctly. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, so uh, haiku about Waldo. Waldo just asked for directions. Even he doesn't know where he is. <laughs> All right. That's great. That's great. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming on this evening. Glad to be here. I thanks appreciate the haiku and thanks for all the info on Battleborn Slam. Yeah, thank you for having awesome. me. Stay tuned. It's coming up, we have Dylan interviewing Ray Seffo, the president of the World Series of Fighting. Thank you. Are you constantly on the go with no time to prepare fresh, delicious meals? You've been meaning to meal prep, haven't you? Well, let Pollock Meal Prep do the cooking for you. Pollock Meal Prep is the newest Las Vegas-based meal prep service. No matter what your busy is, and I know we get busy, Pollock has you covered. We prep for those who work out, busy moms who want to eat better in their families, and people who just want better ingredients in their bodies. After all, you are what you eat. So what's your busy? Please visit us at www.potluckmealprep.com and follow us on Facebook and Instagram to see what's cooking today. I created Potluck to help people be able to sit back and live. I strive to create fresh, delicious meals that you can enjoy on the go, in the office or at home, but always at your convenience. And as always, my meals offer healthier alternatives to pork and beef, so every meal for me is eating for a better life. So what's your busy? Log on to www.hotluckmeal. Yeah. Ouch. Good. All right, you guys are going to love our next guest. He is a six-time world Muay Thai and kickboxing champion, and he is also the president of the WSOF, the World Series of Fighting. Please put your hands together for Ray Seppo. Come on out. Yes. So exciting. What's up, bud? How you doing? Wow, that was great. Have a seat. You guys, All right, Ray, thank you for coming out. I appreciate it. So, you know, you've had a lot of experience in front of thousands of people fighting. So, uh, obviously, you have developed nerves of steel in those kind of situations. Does that same kind of uh, nerve of steel transfer over to all aspects of your life? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
you said it right. It doesn't matter where I'm at or what situation I'm in. I find that I always relate everything back to fighting, uh, whether it's to do with confidence, whether it's to meet people or... Right. I feel like baking some cupcakes. It right. Goes right back <laughs> <Exactly>. to fighting, <laughs> right? Yeah, this thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but yeah, I, I find that most of my experiences um, or anything that I experience in life, I always you know, go back to whether I've experienced that throughout training camp or throughout being in another part of the world um, or within just within my team. So um, fortunate that I'm able to kind of relate everything back to martial arts, if you will. Yeah. yeah. So one thing I found really interesting when we talked before is you talked about a specific state you try to be in where you, call, you called it sharp, being sharp. Right. I was wondering if we could dive into that a little bit more because you know, everybody's like, you know, be relaxed for the fight, but then they're like, get up and have a bunch of energy. Like, what does sharp mean to you? And, and especially how could other people apply it? Yeah, um, I, you know, I've uh, applied that in my own game, and I, I also teach that when I'm coaching because uh, I coach at Extreme Couture uh, as well. Um, and so sharp means, you know, when you go through a training camp, when you put in eight to ten weeks of camp, uh, you go through all the things that you need to prepare f for the particular opponent that you're getting ready for. And so yeah. when you've done this day in, day out, six days a week, twice a day, so you spend six hours a day, just going through moves and practicing and so on. So when I call Sharp, or one of my teammates calls Sharp, it's about me relating uh, or putting everything together without having to think about it. It's just a reaction now. And so staying sharp is mean, why, eyes wide open, be conscious of what's happening, yeah. uh, be aware of what his weaknesses would be uh, or his strengths are. And so, yes, yeah, so, so the, the word Sharp, um, kind of applies to that whole scene and that whole package. You really have to be within that moment, be conscious of everything that's happening. Yeah. Yeah, so, so sometimes people say like 50, some people describe it 50% mental, 50% physical, would you? That is correct. Uh, so 50, when I first started, uh, and it wasn't until I won my second world title that I realized, I come to understand, and I think it's, it's about understanding yourself and your what you're capable of doing and having confidence in your ability. Um, the 50% part uh, mental and physical changes. So for me, up to that point, it was 50-50. But from that point onwards, it was 80-20. It was 80% uh, physical kind of and 20% an mental. Yeah. And the 80% physical uh, was getting my whole body and being ready for the actual competition. The 20% is me already understanding who I am as a fighter yeah. and what I'm bringing to the table and what I'm going to do to win that fight. So, yeah, so that, you know, ratio changed as, you know, as I yeah. went on in my career. But when you start, yeah, 100%, it is 50-50. <laughs> yeah, I'd just be scrambled up everywhere, I couldn't <laughs> imagine. You know, when we were chatting before, it blew my mind you said at one point that you'd like hurt your ankle or twisted it or something, but you couldn't even show that. Like you couldn't even show that to the opponent because then, you know, they would, they'd go for it. So you had to not only fight through it, but you had to fight through it in a way that convinced him it didn't even right. happen. It, it, absolutely. I, I think I, uh, in the first round, I, I throw this kick and the guy was a world karate champion. Uh, it's, and he's a southpaw, and when a southpaw is a guy that's a, a left-hander, and I'm a right-hander, so uh, I go to inside kick his leg, he checks, and I, uh, of course, I kick right at the, the top of his knee, uh. and I didn't know my injury at the time, but inside I'm smiling, but uh, I mean, outside I'm smiling, but inside I'm dying, <laughs> and, and so I you know, I'm literally like this, we're good, <laughs> but inside I'm dying, and right. um, so I had to hide that as the fight progressed. Uh, I stopped him in the second round, but yeah, part of that is, again, it comes back to the, the mental strength of understanding what you're capable of doing, right. and now you got to disguise and really become an actor yeah. in there. Um, and show and don't show any weaknesses. And of course, if I shown that, you know, right then and then, I believe he would have completely yes, gotten confident it, right? and yeah. then probably attack more in the way. Well, yeah, and, and to a lesser extent, I think everybody knows what it's like to, you know, not be in a good mood, but you have to go to work and just kind of go through it and like you start convincing yourself 
you know, that I need to do this for the good of everyone around me. Like, just right. keep it, you know, look at the long-term vision. Right, absolutely. Um, yeah. And again, you know, uh, that's where a lot of it uh, come, becomes, this, the game yeah. becomes mental is when you get into those difficult situations uh, in, the, in the fight, it's so also the same when you apply it to your work life or to your business. There are times where you're going to have great times and there are times where you're yeah. going to have down times. And so you really got to know how yeah. to, you know, go, you, go, you know what, today is just another day. Tomorrow might yeah. be different. You know what I mean? But it's up to you to really make those right. changes and uh, prove to yourself that you can continue to go. You know, it doesn't, like, from someone from the outside, it doesn't actually even seem like winning and losing is, is the whole battle you're facing there. Because, I mean, in some ways, maybe, like, losing with, like, a certain amount of, I guess respect or uh, understanding that like kids are watching you and looking up right. to you is got to be a kind of a win in its own way. So how how are you defining the win and loss? Well, the win the win and loss is part of you got to understand that as and of course uh, I didn't understand that until you know kind of by the time like I said by the time I won my second world title um, I didn't understand it yet. Uh, all I was thinking about was winning. Right. There was no place for losing, right? And I thought if you lost, that was the end of it. Right. But that really isn't the end of it. The, the loss part, when you understand yourself and the, the game and, and, and the reality of the game is that you're going to win some and you're going to lose some, just like how it is right. in life. Like life yeah. And so you just got to know it's not about losing, it's about getting back up and, yeah. and how you come back. Yeah, like if you juxtapose the first time you took a really big loss in a big setting and the last time you took a loss, were you, what was different between those two versions? When I went to K1, I was undefeated uh, with five world titles under my belt. I had won five oh, world yeah. titles throughout. So you couldn't even imagine losing. So yeah. I didn't even think about losing. But my first loss was, to get, was against a, um, a legend in the sport, Ernesto Hoos from Holland. Did he get lucky? Uh, no, no, he, he, yeah, no, I, I actually, okay. between us, I was actually 10% ready for that fight. It was, okay. it, it wasn't, no, no excuses because Ernesto Hoos is a legend. Nothing but respect and love for that guy. But uh, I went into that fight, and like my whole camp was saying, Ray, you, you shouldn't fight this fight. But that was my first fight. That was the uh, opening of me getting into K1. And the way I looked at it, although I wasn't ready for that fight, the way I looked at it was, if I don't take this opportunity, this opportunity may never come back, right. come around again. And life doesn't wait for you to be ready all exactly. the time. Yeah. So, and I knew, and I was, you know, 100% sure within myself, and also I had already accepted it in myself that he had to knock me out cold to win that fight. I was prepared going into <laughs> that fight, that's what's going to happen. Um, so, needless to say, after the first round, I was gassed. He was kicking the crap out of me. I don't know if I can use that word, but <laughs> yeah, he was, <laughs> my knee was crap. out. They can have right, it. okay. Yeah. My knee was out, you know, this was like this, oh. right? And so I, I had been on my backside at least two, three, four yeah. times. By the time the fourth round ended, one of the Japanese coaches goes to my corner and tells my coach, listen, this guy has shown that he is a warrior, but he's not going to win this fight, so why take more punishment? So the towel got thrown because I wouldn't quit. The next day, uh, I lost the fight. The next day, I get called uh, to lunch with the president of uh, K1, and he says, Ray, I have never seen a heart so big as that, and he has a two-year contract. <laughs> So, so there you go, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wow. So wow, yeah, that's I, a great example. You know, so, so yeah, like, I, I took that. I took that chance knowing I was gonna get my backside handed to me, but I also was, a, you know, I had accepted that. Yeah. And I was willing to sh show this K1 that I was, I had all the skills in the world, but also the heart to take it to the yeah. best or to compete with the best of the best in the world. So I want to I want to talk about your transition from this great career in fighting to um, the WSOF and and how that happened and what the WSOF is. Well, the worst is of fighting it was something that uh, you know it, it came about. I was doing an interview on Tab Out Radio and Tab Out Radio 
uh, Crooklyn was a, uh, uh, and the team there were uh, big fans of K1. And at the time, K1 had gone into bankruptcy. And um, as we're talking about this, um, the idea of me taking that over and or starting a, a fight league uh, was, you know, was somewhat embedded in my mind. And something clicked in that interview, and I just decided that that was something I wanted to do. It was something that I wanted to. Uh, to do, but to also give back to the sport. And I know that there's a lot of uh, fighters that w are looking for an opportunity or looking for another league that they can showcase their skills. And lo and behold, you know, when we started, uh, myself and my partner started Worcesters of Fighting, uh, there was a lot of fighters like Andre Yalowski, Anthony Johnson, um, John Fitch. I mean, all these big names uh, became available, but also there was a lot of big names that was also free agents. Right. And so um, that's how pretty much how it started, and it started right here in Las Vegas. Oh, that's good, local. Right. I, love, I love that you have the WSOF here in Las Vegas. I think that is so cool. I've been to one of them at the Hard Rock. I thought that was great that you held it here and everything. Right. Um, okay, so I know you, one thing that's kind of interesting about fighting is that you're always sizing people up, right? Like you're, it's not really just like football or basketball where you have this sort of, sort of team dynamic. You have this real size up of somebody. Um, I'm sure you got pretty good at looking at fighters and kind of knowing what they're going to do in the ring. Can you do that outside when it comes to a business setting? Do you consider yeah. yourself good at that also? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'll use an example. Um, a buddy of mine was in a, a meeting um, and I was walking past the lobby. And so he called me into this meeting and introduced me to the gentleman that he's meeting with. Within a minute, I got up, I, I, you know, I excused myself and I said, oh, you know, we'll catch up later. And two hours later, I, I, you know, I meet up with him again and I said, be careful on your business outings with this guy because for some reason he gives me this real kind of negative energy. Now, um, I think two months later he found out that uh, this guy tried to, Bad guy. Yeah, yeah, he didn't turn out to be a guy, a, a, a good person. And so, right. again, uh, you know, I... I kind of getting in tune with that body energy. Yeah, yeah, it's about reading, you know, and maybe that comes from just studying a lot of fighters and studying people. And then, of course, when you meet a lot of people throughout... Uh, I've traveled, right, the, traveled world. the world, yeah, yeah. and yeah. so you meet a lot of different people, and some, you, some people you feel really good with, and some you meet people, and, and I'm sure everybody can relate to this, when you meet certain people, you feel like you've known them for years. And then some people you go, mm, I'm not sure. You know what I mean? So, right. and maybe part of that comes from studying a lot of fighters or meeting a lot of people from around the world. Yeah, yeah. And it's important to listen to that gut instinct because, you know, down the road it does. Yeah, it seems exactly. To, it seems like we're right more than we think we are. I, I always say it's my twin brother, but yeah. <laughs> uh, I lost my twin brother when he, when he was two, wow. so... I feel like a lot of a lot of the decisions that I make in life, I feel like I have this voice talking to me all the time. You and really lost your twin brother? I didn't. Yeah. I didn't see that in the pre-interview. Wow. Yeah. That's so crazy. A anyways, um, okay. So I know we're running out of time, but uh, WSOF is uh, a place that is here in Las Vegas. You guys sell tickets to. Set I know events are all over the country, but a lot of right. times they come here through Vegas. Um, just give the audience a taste of how they could come see one of the shows and what's next for the WSOF. Yet, um, the next show is actually October 7th uh, in Kansas City. But the biggest news is uh, for us, which we kind of announced a couple of weeks ago on national television. Again, Worst of the Fighting is on NBC Sports Network. Um, and the biggest announcement that we've done in the last couple of weeks is that New Year's Eve, we actually have a show at the Madison Square Garden Theater. So, uh, wow, which is, that's cool. Yeah, yeah which that's is true. Give it up for it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, um, yes. And that, that New Year's Eve show is actually on the big NBC. Oh, so, yeah, the national one. Yeah, so it, uh, we're very, you know, again, I, I thank the good Lord every day because uh, I feel like, you know, we are talking about earlier. I got into martial arts not because of any of fame or anything else like that. It was just something that it was, I felt like, it, you know, I was intrigued about it. And also I had always seen, you know, when I, at seven years old, I watched, a Jackie Chan movie and a Bruce Lee movie. And I was like, well, if they can do it, I can do it. So that's how kind of that thing right. started. Do you think we could have a quick arm wrestling match? I just want to see what that's like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, I thought, uh, you know, I, I'm not, you know, if you guys want to see it, it'd be good. All right, put All it right. up here. I just, you know, I've just got to, I've got to feel what that's like. Go. <laughs> 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 Oh, 
Yes! Good man, Lenny. All right, give it up for Ray Seppo, everyone. Thank you for coming out. <laughs> that is so hey, fun. Brother, Great job. It. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Most of us begin our lives full of tears and screams. We are confused. We are in pain from doctors smacking our bottoms. We are angry. Someone smushed our bodies through a narrow passageway out of the warm, nurturing amniotic fluid and into a place where our lungs must now expand. We inhale and we cry. The first time I babysat a newborn, I tried not to interact with her. Babies make me uncomfortable because they don't use words. This child was sensitive to my movements and my mood. She wanted me to smile, wanted me to give her kisses, and she quickly cleared the room of its awkward silence. Babies have no problem expressing their needs nor their discontent. Over time, we stop coddling our children and force them to use their words but crying is our purest form of communication before we befuddle meaning and convolute life with euphemisms. How did it transform into a sign of weakness? It's like we've forgotten what crying is for. It is for absolute joy and clarity, for the father who has lost his daughter, for the man overflowing with rage, for the child who learns the wrath of her parents after talking back, for the mother all out of baby wipes whose child just over pooped her diaper. Crying is for the death of Mufasa and your pet rock, for Toy Story 3, for onions and spilled milk, for the last Girl Scout cookie and an empty bag of M&Ms, for holy socks, double rainbows, and blue sky. I cried in the middle of a class because I was realizing that discussing my dreams right in the middle of that seat and graduation two weeks away, I was moments from becoming everything I ever said I wanted to be when I grew up. I always cry the purest tears at the sight of women in bridal gowns. Somewhere in the depth of my essence, I always feel hope, like maybe her marriage will last. Maybe they mean it. Maybe if my best friend can connect and commit to the love of his life, that I can do that too. I wrote a poem through tears and snot in a dark closet in my own empty apartment. I don't know who I was hiding from. I just, I don't know if I hid because I was ashamed. I just felt weakened. I felt tired and weary. I felt like the moon was full and my face was the beach overcome by the rising tide. I felt like I was drowning in every emotion I had locked away. Crying is for humans. For the days we wonder if someone will ever love us unconditionally. When I worry no one will ever find me desirable enough that I won't ever possess the qualifications to be called wife. Before there are words, there is noise and there are tears. Parents become attuned to the intonation of their child's voice. I am becoming more comfortable speaking this mother tongue in public. I cry often. I am unashamed. I am proof that God lives in all things, even a tiny drop of water falling from a child's eye. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for Vogue Robinson. Oh, that was awesome. Yeah, I had a chance to uh, I had a ch chance to experience one of the. How can we connect with you and get involved in something like that? Um, you can add us on Facebook. It's just first name is Battleborn and the last name is Slam. And then if you were wanting to donate to help with the travel costs or just putting food in our tummies, you can also donate on GoFundMe.com backslash Battleborn Slam. So those are two ways you can kind of stay in contact with us. And we also have a chat book. So if you want to take a piece of our poetry home, every year the Slam team compiles our poems together and it goes into a lovely little book and we sign it, and it has pictures of us on it. Vogue Robinson. <laughs> All right, Vogue, don't go in the house. OK, here we go. Three, two, one. Yeah! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's our show. I'd like to thank all of our guests this evening. Thank you to our cast and crew and to all you podcasts at home. Remember, you're all welcome to be a part of our live studio audience every Thursday night, 9 p.m., right here at the Inspire Theater, corner of Las Vegas Boulevard and Fremont Street. Party with us on the rooftop for the after party. You can catch me for the after after party at the downtown cocktail room. Don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Downtown Podcast. Thank you 
Salamat, salamat, peace, love, and be kind to one another. Shout out to Corduroy Maverick, Soul Supplement Records, 10 year anniversary. Thank you for the track. Yeah.